Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor and great pleasure of being invited back again to Singapore to share with you our experience in building, um, we hope, if you get there, a world class emergency medical services. And actually, I want to thank a lot of my mentors in Singapore, among them uh, Professor Amanda, who has been mentoring me over the last decade in developing emergency medicine and EMS <coughs> in Taiwan. So that's me. <laughs> so the next uh, half an hour, I'd like to share with you some of the historical background is leading to the development of modern EMS and the attributes of a modern EMS. Secondly, I want to chronicle the development of modern EMS in Taiwan. And I want to share with you some of the top strategy priorities we think will work for us. And lastly, the momentum that drives the societal movement in developing a better EMS. So EMS is the practice of medicine outside facility, outside the hospital. The core of this is medical care. However, you need to combine public health and public safety to make it a public safety network for your community. It's a daunting job. People trace the development of modern uh, EMS to this guy. Dominic John Lake is the um, uh, Surgeon General to Napoleon who raised two ideas who were vital to a modern EMS emergency medicine. First, he designed the first ambulance. Hey, that is the idea of ambulatory move, quickly moving the patient out of the battlefield. And secondly, he also raised the idea of combat triage. The development of EMS in emergency medicine coincided with war. <coughs> During the American Civil War, it took them three days to move a critically ill, uh, injured patient to a hospital. Fifty years from that, it took less than eight hours to move a battle a soldier uh, to the hospital because of a mobilized vehicle. And we saw a huge development during the Second World War because the medics because the development of transfusion technology and also the emergence of, of antibodies which cures infection. And then in Korean War, the transportation moved from horizontal to vertical with the advent of helicopters. And almost 50 years uh, before, in Vietnam, we see the model of current trauma care system that you move very fast, those injured through helicopter and good quality medics to match the military hospital where they get life-saving procedures. This was the foundation of the current uh, uh, trauma care system, even in our civil communities. In the meantime, people are saving more lives uh, from cardiac arrest due to the contribution, understanding in airway, ventilation, and circulation. So the way we do CPR, A, B, and C was promulgated in 1960 and remains so. A, uh, professor uh, Dr. Pendridge uh, in Northern Ireland starts mobile ICU care to attend to uh, people with acute myocardial infarction. Painstakingly move large uh, defibrillators to take care of patients with acute myocardial infarction. It was a huge success, and uh, he reported uh, his idea in the American College of College uh, meeting. So in 1966, in this landmark uh, publication published by the National Science Council, entitled Accidental <laughs> Death and Disability, The Neglected Disease of Modern Society, a lot of shortcomings, deficiencies in, modern, in the problem of taking care of, of acute injured and ill patients in modern society were pointed out and called for a better coordination of system of care. Following Dr. Pendridge's idea, a lot of experiments were started in North America. 
in Columbus, Miami, Los Angeles, in Seattle. And these were all addressing Southern Party guests. They're all positioned um, staff, the people, uh, very similar to the initial endeavors uh, from Europe. It was not until 1969 when this gentleman, uh, Dr. Leo Koch from Seattle, went to his police chief, Gordon Vickery, and said, hey, we can save people in the free hospital arena, and you have this bunch of good people. Can you send your people to me in Seattle, in the University of Washington, so I can train them? to perform as well, or almost as well, as doctors in the field under our supervision. And that started the uh, North American model or the fire department model of the EMS as we know today. And this has remained the benchmark of a very good EMS system. And after that, uh, the law in, uh, in America, uh, the EMS Act of 1973, call for a creation of system to cope with the daily emergency in, in, uh, in our community. So, 40 years after the initial pilot, the publication of National Science in the paper, IOM Institute of Medicine uh, issued a document again called EMS at the Crossroad. It pointed out a lot of problems of EMS at the time including the lack of coordination, disparities, and certain quality and, and, the, and adequate preparedness for disasters. And it called for areas to improve, including uh, good lead agencies, standards, medical directions, coordination and com uh, communication, among others. In another, in another uh, publication, the EMS Agenda for the Future, is that a good EMS should be community-based and should identify injury and illness at risk, not only provide care to the kill illness, but also contribute to treatment of chronic conditions. It will redistribute healthcare resources and integrate with others. So the attributes they call for include integration, research, finance, education, medical education, public access, good clinical care, and etc. And these are the areas we're working toward in building a modern, world-class EMS. So what's happening in Taiwan? Where is Taiwan? Where are your neighbors only four hours away? We're very similar epidemiology, um, and very good food as well. <laughs> Like many of our counterparts in East Asia, I will share very similar epidemiology, uh, cancer being the number one killer and cardiovascular disease choke being number two and number three. Over the last 20 years, we have witnessed rapid development of EMS and trauma care system, and that was started by a uh, mother legislation. In our system, we leave, everything starts with a law. So we will pretty much follow the North American system by crafting a top of the level EMS Act that would have that happened in 1995. And the emergence of emergency physician, emergency medicine as a core specialty also helped a lot because we are pumping a lot of goodwill emergency <coughs> physician interested in the development of emergency medicine and EMS into the system. And then we are implementing AEDs. AOS, and then we we'll craft the law again to allow for the development of medical direction, regional coordination, and finally public access distribution. And I'll deliberate a little more in detail. In the meantime, the, the process of development were um, got some momentum by unexpected incidents. Number one is a very big tragic earthquake happening in 1999. The Chiki earthquake called. Uh, uh, causing casualty, uh, mortality of 1,500 people, really make people in the society realize how ill prepared we are and the importance of emergency medicine and disaster medicine in general. 
And the other lesson we learned, I think, as well, you guys, are the lesson from SARS. Uh, that at the time, our whole health system, our whole health system, was badly hit by the epidemic, and our government, our Ministry of Health, and the hospital alike realized it's very important to, to coordinate and integrate healthcare system. Nobody is living alone. We are all interconnected for epidemic, for trauma, for stroke. Yes. So like many other systems, our system starts with uh, system access to a dialing 119. And people say, why are we dialing 119 instead of 911? I would say because we are on the upper side, upper side of the globe, so we read 911 in reverse, it's 119. <laughs> well, we actually date it back to the time when we are under Japanese control, so they use 119 and we use 119. So it's a universal number, it's vertical uh, dispatch, and of course we have a location identification, and now we are providing dispatch CPR and PAI. CPR education is delivered through a combination of network to the hospital, the National Resuscitation Council, the Red Cross, the school and the military. However, the uh, extent people are willing to do CPR, I would say uh, suboptimal, only at 15 to 20 percent. <coughs> Around the year 2000, uh, we have all VOS defibrillation system, one here, fire department based uh, EMS with defibrillating capability. At the time, we didn't have the capability of providing advanced life support. It was not there, there was no providers, there was no law. So uh, one of the pilots started from the university by a very vivid, my very uh, visionary uh, mentor, uh, Professor Lin, is we want to join this from the hospital side instead of just criticizing guys in the pre-hospital setting are not doing the job. We jump into the mud and work with them. So we start with together with the Department of Health by starting a pilot project to provide hospital-based advanced life support. We got some seed grant from the Ministry of Health and using uh, the NTU as the epicenter and we draw an area which covers approximately eight minutes of travel time to provide advanced life support. This will be delivered by nurses and doctors from the busy emergency department. And you can imagine we are already you know, flooded with patients and but we're committed to provide advanced life support care in addition to those already uh, developed by the fire departments. And this was one of the very early few states of cardiac arrest in the pre-hospital arena. You can see a uh, patient were intubated by one of the residents, defibrillated, assisted by uh, EMT. In addition to ordinary uh, rescue business, the practice of a second physician to the field also were able to prepare our physicians when they encounter uh, scene care or disaster response. So right after the pilot project, we have a devastating earthquake, and a lot of the physicians with Taipei CD went to the scene. They were not afraid because they have been practicing uh, pre-hospital care. And it surely brought together the mentality and the gap between emergency physician, ED, and uh, pre-hospital workers. However, the staffing and timelines will be very limited, so it's just a pilot project. We know we are going to move toward a safety-based uh, AOS system. So we work with the fire department to start training of AOS providers, and we started in several metropolitan areas. And uh, we started a uh, versatile ambulance deployment based on um, GIS uh, calculation. And we were helped by motorcycle uh, ambulance squads. So right now, since 19, uh, 2003, uh, in many of the metropolitan area, we now have fire department based advanced life support two-tier systems. And after that, in 2008, we started by crafting a law, the regionalization process, so that the major time-critical diagnosis, such as 
acute stroke, AMR, and trauma can get to the right place at the right time, breaking down the barrier of administration areas. This is called regionalization. So by changing, uh, by amending the EMS Act, it allows me to categorize the hospitals according to critical level, acute care, and general levels based on their capability and capacity of stroke, trauma, and PCI. And policy <coughs> on triage, diversion, and bypass were prom promulgated and disseminated. They were doing quite good, not exactly. When we look at our uh, channel of survival of the community at 2010, we identified a lot of problems. The rate of bystander CPR was very low at 15 to 20. People were not willing to receive CPR and AED because it took so long, about four hours. There was no law regulating or authorizing PAD, and people were not being protected by the Samaritan law. And although we thought of the response time was good, even in downtown Taipei, where we have a lot of hospitals, the travel time from call to arrival at the scene will be five to nine minutes, and from dispatch to arrive at the scene will be three to six minutes. If nothing is being done in between, the patient will die. So then from 2010 and 11, we started a national task force to develop CPR for AD in the public setting. A blue ribbon panel was assembled under the auspice of ministry. It's a multidisciplinary team, including emergency medicine, cardiology, critical care, education, and law. And we were divided to a legal panel to craft the law, education panel to change the way we teach, and implementation channel. And we engaged all parties involved, including uh, fire, emergency medicine, cardiology, critical care, and EMTs. Through a lot of workshops, conference, public hearings, and international advisees meetings, we came up with the seven pillars of Taiwan PD. The consensus-driven process. We believe the process should be guided by national and local health authority. It should be overseen by academia, like us. It should be regulated and protected by law. It should be linked to EMS. And the, the deployment of the device should not be random. It should be evidence-based and strategically placed. It should be disseminated by streamlined and effective and simple education. And finally, we need to engage the community. So with all the effort, we finally got the law amended again in uh, January 2014. So now required place to, to uh, install the PAD. It also has a compulsory registration for all the public AD by law. All these AD need to register themselves. We also pass the Good Samaritan uh, clause in the piece of legislation. By reviewing the epidemiology by in accordance with American Heart and European Resuscitation Council guidelines, we came up with eight areas where public aid needs to be implemented. We change the way people are educated. Those who have the obligation of responding or managing the AD will learn complete CPR plus AD and managing. For those just ordinary people who strip down our respiration, they just need compression only CPR plus AD, which took an hour. On top of this, we start to build ancillary uh, PAD infrastructures, such as the COSA regulation, the toolkits for the site, registration system, and also a certification process uh, for the public sites. So among all these efforts, there are so many things to do. When you look back, the IOM recommendation, when you look back, the uh, EMS agenda of the, uh, the future, there are a bunch of them, but I will leave three priority areas, three areas that we think very important 
and these are areas we spend a lot of time and energy, and they are provider education, medical care direction, and research, and I will elaborate. To develop a good EMS, I think provider education to produce high quality, knowledgeable, dedicated provider will be the most important task. I think a generation later from now, me and my colleagues won't be remembered or recognized by what we have done, but will be remembered and recognized by what our students have done. Because by educating good providers, they will carry on the thoughts and the genes so our ideal can propagate. So we have four levels of providers. We make sure that we lay out the competency and objectives of their, uh, their, their job. For the main part of EMT2, who receive 280 hours of training, we make them EMTD plus. So they are the EMT, they defibrillate, they are authorized to do uh, LFA, they are authorized to give clear fluids. For the selected few, about 10% of paramedic students, they not only would provide advanced life support care, we think they will be the leaders of future system implementation, design, management, and education. So they will be the elite. We try to standardize our uh, education process and material and testing. The goal is all the EMS education will be consistent and we evaluate the performance and their retention. We try to incorporate innovation during the delivery of education. And finally, we make sure the education is need-based. The bottom line is, during this education, no EFT will be left behind. The second thing we think is very important is the establishment of medical direction. So every aspect of the EMS will be under the supervision and careful um, direction. <clears throat> Two decades ago, like many communities, we had this advisory committee. Who are the advisors? They are the big shots. They wear 20 hats. <clears throat> They spend 30 minutes in the meeting, they have no time spending together with the paramedics, right? So we need to craft it and come up with another structure where we have young, enthusiastic physicians interested in EMS working alone with the paramedics. And they are the medical directors. So we first started this medical directors committee under the fire department. We believe they should play the leadership, liaison, advocacy, and make sure uh, the system performs clinical excellence. Medical directors lead by shaping the system to design policy, by inspiring new providers, and by advanced science and discipline through um, research. It has to be a very good communicator, juggling between a lot of medical specialties and a lot of uh, collaborators and administrative arms. Most importantly, I think, medical directors breach the cultures of two worlds. I don't know whether you know Wen Chen Gongzhu, the current doctor. Wen Chen Gongzhu was a uh, Princess in Tang Dynasty, when the time China was at Ao Tibet, she was married to Tibet as a gesture of peace. But at the time, she brought with her a lot of concept, culture, and thoughts from central China. So, medical director, to me, 
our old Winston Gongzhu to the EMS. They bring to the fire suppression public safety arena concept they are not familiar with, such as evidence-based medicine, quality data, patient safety, and research. When you first approach the public safety uh, agency, you said, you have problems. Give me the data. It's like, we have no data. Problem? No problem. What are you talking about? It's very different from people in healthcare who constantly identify problems and try to address them. So it's a cultural clash. So we started the pilot project in 2006, and the law was amended to legalize and require all medical, all jurisdictions to have medical directors. And we also come up with regulations um, to guide uh, medical director education. Now in a formal education of first 34 hours, including didactic and apprenticeship. We also work together with foreign friends from Canada, from uh, uh, NADMSP, from Asian EMS Council, to, to make our training process more uh, compliant and compatible with international counterparts. Now we have a huge collection of wielding enthusiastic medical directors, and they need monthly to change ideas, to promulgate quality indicators in improving uh, system of care in their individual EMS. Last but not least, is research. In EMS, we need good quality research and evaluation to justify our own existence. We believe quality assurance and research should be built into the system, in the infrastructure. It should get a buy-in from all parties and create a win-win situation and should be evidence-based to guide local policies. I'll give you a few examples. During the course of our development in our system of care, in our, our, our channel of survival, we spare no effort in examining dispatch performance, quality of AED, defibrillation, AOS demand. How to build things into the system? A few examples. Since 1998, 1999, we start to track patients of cardiac arrest with registry. These are painstaking, labor intensive. Now we have involved into the fourth generation, <coughs> where within two hours, the run sheet is uploaded to the web. It is pushed to the receiving hospital. And within 24 hours, the hospital are required to report initial costs because the fire department wants to know that. In a week, all eight directors were reviewed, and finally, uh, the outcome of the patient will be traced. How can we ensure compliance? The compliance of registry is written by this regulation. During the annual evaluation of EMS hospital, it took up five to eight points. If, if you don't fill it up, you don't trace a patient, you get zero points out of eight. This is stick. But Carrot is it, a very user-friendly system. So for all, all the hospital, they are happy to use it to sort of trace their own patients. We use the same idea to trace our performance of PAD. In our current uh, piece of regulation, after the public AD is deployed or uh, activated, the site managers need to build up a form, and together with the vendor, they need to download the electronic file of incidents and report to Ministry of Health within seven days. We want to make sure we got all the data to do further research and evaluation afterward. What it is? AD data. 
A thousand, how many years ago when we started the AD we knew it contained a lot of information on this application, on effectiveness, on outcome. However, we ran into a problem. The older firefighter vehemently opposed collecting AD files. They said this is going to reveal what we have been doing. We don't want to be reported. We don't want to be known what's going on. We come up with a quality assurance uh, instrument and we come up with a policy to reward successful pre-hospital resuscitation. So for all pre-hospital providers, if they were successful in bringing someone back, they get cash bonus, they get push points, they get promotion, but I need evidence. In addition to a written report, I need evidence documented and supported by the AD report. So I still really remember around the year 2001, we have a say. You know, at the time we didn't have a lot of say. So we we're all very happy. In my emergency department, I was talking to this paramedic saying, well, can I take a look of your AED file? And he looked at me, grabbed his AED, saying, Dr. Ma, wait a minute, I'll make a copy and I'll give it to you. So I know we have succeeded because the paramedic identified the AED record, the keeping of records and data as a vital part of their practice. We're also able to trace the performance of CPR in these AD records, so we know a third of them are not doing good quality CPR. Over the years, we have accumulated every single case of AED over the 10 years. There are a lot of data. There's no way we can manually trace them anymore. So we work with the mathematician using a technique called empirical mode decomposition. We can dissect these AED graphics into different channels, and some of the channels will coincide with compression signals. So we now derive an algorithm to automatically run through the AED files, so you can see the compression signals out of it, and this is very comparable to those of manual reviews. A vendor came up to me promoting mechanical CPR in the back of the envelope. I said, wait a minute, I need more evidence. So when we started the process and accumulated uh, uh, evidence uh, through video review, we found actually they are equally effective and most of the interruptions are not because of environmental areas but, but rather of uh, provider problems. We saw a lot of evidence, a lot of evidence from Western communities, old host studies, rock studies. Can we borrow the results from them? Are those results translated directly to our practice and influence the way we practice? Yes and no. I believe that there are strong aspects in our epidemiology, the way we practice, the way we craft our system, that we need local evidence to change our practice, to guide our practice. So we study the way AOS is affecting our practice, and we conclude that it's substantial, so we keep doing AOS to our population. Compression first and analysis first, because our population has a lower incidence of ventricular fibrillation and lower bystander CPR. So we theorize that by providing longer duration of pre-analysis CPR is beneficial. We did a randomized clinical trials in Taipei, and among those who uh, got rocked, those who have better, uh, more compression <coughs> the stand uh, has better survival to discharge. So we believe in Taiwan as well as in Singapore, the policy consideration in EMS should factor in patient pathophysiology, should factor in community factors such as the shock algorithm and the level of bystander CPR. 
and the ease of education factor in cultural background. So over the last 20 years, our survival rate of cardio rates has increased manifold. This did not happen overnight. Once upon a time, there was no communication between fire and health. There's no direction. There's no standardization. Minimal of community uh, involvement. And worst of, all, worst of all, nepotism among the providers. Every time I show leadership, and this guy, everybody starts to laugh. He's probably the most popular person in Taiwan right now. Uh, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> However, Taiwan is still a very top-down community, society. Whatever we do, we spend 70% of our effort, effort trying to convince our leaders in the community this is the right way to do it. If we were successful in convincing him EMS is cost effective, it's worthwhile, we'll make him re-elected <laughs> <laughs> by taking hands with kids, you know, doing the interesting thing. They will allocate more money, more staff, more personnel to your system. Um, so this is very important, and very sound strategy, three year, five year, and ten years. We spare an effort in recognizing our professionals, and we got huge support from our communities. All of the public ambulances in Taiwan are donated by charities, especially the Buddhist temple. None of the fire department ambulances are procured by the government. They all came from donations. In Taipei City, if you want to donate an ambulance, you have to wait in line for two years. <laughs> you cannot just donate one ambulance. You have to donate the ambulance with the list equipment they want. Why they want to donate? Because this ambulance, for the next five to years, seven years, will be running around on the streets with lights and siren, saving people with your name on it. <laughs> There's no better way for publicity. <laughs> when we were trying to get motorcycle vehicle ambulance for our community, we said, well, these are big, you know, BMW motorcycles, they're very costly. We're successful in getting donations from the bank. So they are running the streets with ambulance of the Taipei Fire Department and the bank on the side. So some aware citizens think they are sending emergency cash. <laughs> Companies are willing to donate money to train our providers. So the first batch of paramedics, we actually got the money from an insurance company. We'd like to offer candles in the uh, temples. We are now channeling this. <laughs> Say, offering <laughs> it is like offering blessing light. So by donating money, your light on the AD will be shining, saving people with the outfit of God from the temple. <laughs> Lastly, the performance of EMS needs to be transparent and accountable. People are watching us. 2008, one of the magazines has this survey on the performance of EMS. Those on top of the list are very happy. Those are at the bottom of the list, very unhappy. So uh, public disclosure makes a huge pressure on local administrators to improve the quality. It happened again last year when we started our PAD process. One of the magazines had this report on a tabulation and comparison of CT which best implemented AD. 
those who perform bad now scratch, you know, scratch their head to, to better implement and better uh, register their abuse. We also spare the effort in collaborating with our friends, such as uh, Association Council of Asia, Harold, uh, the Wuhan collaborators in promoting science research. So, I think up to now you all believe in me that EMS is the right thing to do. Yet, we have it, we have to do it in the right way. Hopefully, we're doing it in a prospective way, evidence-based, service, comprehensive, and integrated. Like many of you and many of my mentors in the office, we all wear many hats. But there's no work more rewarding for me than building EMS system. As my uh, alma mater's motto says, because we are saving lives, mainly at the time. With that, I will close my talk and I welcome you to ASEM 2015 in Taipei. Thank you very much.